Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Our study has been the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. That's, that's what we've been focusing on. Now, what, what the writer has done in chapter 10 is he's, he's gone from the superiority of historical Christology over shadow Christology. Now he's getting into doctrines. Now he's showing you that there are certain doctrines that, are, that have been um, like, the, like last week we dealt with forgiveness and he showed how forgiveness is a completed a thing today because of the completed work of Christ on the cross, which it wasn't before. And um, and it doesn't mean that the people didn't have a concept of it. It means that they understood that until Christ came and died on the cross, redemption and everything connected it would not be finished, would not be finished. It, it could be started and continued, but couldn't be finished. They weren't in a, they didn't have a finished product. And we, and we saw that pretty clear. And so when it refers to Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, it's a finished redemption. And therefore, the writer makes a distinction by calling it eternally redeemed, eternal redemption. Remember that in chapter 9. Um, I don't know, verse 12 or something like that. But And so what you have are, are really new concepts of old idea. Old doctrines have been brought into uh, historical Christology in fulfillment. And so the writer is now engaging in that. And here's one, verse 19 through 20. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. One of the first questions, and we'll answer tonight, what is the confidence, what does it mean, the confidence to enter the holy place? What holy place are we talking about that requires the blood of Christ and the flesh of Christ, the body of Christ? Hmm? And you should already know that answer. You shouldn't have to guess on it because we have studied chapter 8, 9, and 10. Okay? So we're going to talk about that tonight because this, what he's going to talk about is really interesting. And he calls, he calls it uh, entering a new and living way. Let me read it again. Maybe your Bible says, therefore, brother and sense. That's okay. Mine read, since therefore, brethren, it's okay. Actually, if yours says, therefore, brethren, since, it's a good translation from the original. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Enter, okay. Enter, watch this now. Don't miss this. To enter a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. So the blood and the body of Christ are essential. The question is, what, what is he talking about? Say, what's he talking about? And so we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to find out what he's talking about. All right, we're going to find out what he's talking about and why this is a phenomenal breakthrough with the new covenant historical Christ rather than old covenant shadow Christology. All right, let's have prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to privilege to confess sin if necessary. Why would it be necessary? Well, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it. You can't, uh, you can't study it and apply it to your life. Can't learn it and live it. Incarnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin, therefore, 
First John 1 9 says, confess it. That would be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and of earth. If we confess our sins, here's the promise. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleansing is the work of Christ from the cross, extended into the Christian life by confession, not by belief, by confession. Not dealing with salvation, we're dealing with spirituality. So be sure you get that done through your priesthood so you can get the maximum of this hour. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet. We pray those, Father, that are somewhere listening to this off the internet, that they would uh, shut down anything that would distract them for an hour, put the cell phone on silence, turn the television off, do what's necessary if you're alone. Otherwise, put yourself in an isolated place so you can study the Bible, so the Holy Spirit can minister the truth to your life. And that you can understand where the freedom comes to the Christian life. You shall know the truth, and the truth is such free. So, Father, we thank you for this. I pray for this kind of responsibility within the believer's priesthood, responsibilities for learning the word of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's what the writer's showing you. In our lesson text, the writer of Hebrews shows how God opened a new living way to the third heaven. The holy place he's talking about is heaven. It's heaven. So you might ask, how do you know that this new living way is to heaven? Well, because I paid attention to chapters 8, 9, and 10. And so when I, after, in a moment, I'll get there. In a moment, I'll get there. But first, let me tell you that at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper that Jesus had, you, you know, the Last Supper that he had with his disciples, which is recorded in John 13 through 17, He introduced to his disciples the doctrine of the new living way to heaven. He introduced this doctrine. The people don't pay a lot of attention to it, but everybody knows the verse. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. I wrote it on your paper. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The writer of Hebrews has picked up on that. And he calls it. Come on. He calls it a new and living way. You understand that? This is where the doctrine was introduced under the new covenant. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Okay? Now, what is interesting, when you go to the book of Acts, in chapter 9, 19, and 24, which is a long stretch, the word the way was a term <laughs> ascribed to followers of Christ after his resurrection. Let me show it to you. It, in Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 1 and 2, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found anyone belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay? The way. This term that Jesus used has become a doctrinal term of those followers coming out of Pentecost of Acts 2 as an important concept. 
I mean, where'd they come up with this idea of the way? Do you understand where they got it? And they got it because Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead. And being raised from the dead was lights out for everybody. And that was a big deal. You understand? In fact, the, the immediate family of Jesus Christ on earth, the, his half-brothers and sisters, so to speak, that's when they got saved. And that's when, when the lights went on and everybody went, whoa. And they were called by a doctrinal term, the way. This this goes from chapter 9, which means that from Pentecost on, this was a term uh, that was ascribed to them by the Jews. The Jews called them the way, right? The Jews. And they were out to stomp the way out, right? <laughs> they were going to shut down the road because the word way is hodas and means road or highway. Back in my day, we had roads. Now we have highways. Right? This term is used in chapter 19. It's used in 24. Now, what you have to know is this was a major term for the followers of Christ after his resurrection and from Pentecost on. This was it, right? But yeah, come on, geez. Now, here's what's missing because sometimes you don't pay up pay attention from chapter 2 to chapter 24 you've got 30 years that's 30 years they're still calling them the way the Jews are still and they're still hunting them they're still trying to stomp them out So this concept of the way became a great doctrinal term. You understand in the early church? Because Christ went to the cross and died, and he was buried and raised from the dead, and the only way to God was through that gospel. And it hasn't changed. The only way into the presence of God positionally is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. No man can come to the Father except through me. Right? And that's before he went to the cross. He goes to the cross, he's buried, he's raised from the dead. That becomes the gospel. And they have attached a doctrinal term to that, meaning no one can have a relationship with God without going through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have positional sanctification, then you have permanent sanctification. If you're in the presence of God at the point of salvation, and you are, no man can come to, no man can come to the Father except through me. If you go through him, you're with the Father. If you die, you're with the Father. You understand? The security, listen, your security is in the hands of God. He said it in John 10, 28 through 30, right? Your security is not in your hands. Your salvation security is in the hands of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not your hands. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as gift of God, not of work. It is not in your hands. You can't give it up. If you wanted to, you could not. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And when you go through Christ, you are in the presence of Christ, in the presence of God positionally. And if you die, you will be there permanently. Come on now. Listen to people lie to you. Listen to the word of God speak to your heart and tell you the truth. This is, and listen, that was the name out of this doctrine that carried the church for 30 years. And I mean carried the church. It carried the enemy against the church for 30, for 30 years, the first 30 years of the church. This was, was battled against. This doctrinal concept was battled against because the gospel was winning people by the thousands. And everywhere they went and preached the gospel, people got saved. 
Church people don't like that. Religious people don't like that. You understand what I mean? I mean in a negative sense now. The apostate church doesn't like to hear that. They have their own Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Number one thing I have fought for 44 years through this church is grace. They battle me on grace. Even doctrinal people battle me on grace. The darndest thing I ever saw. That's what they call themselves. But anyhow, the way. Where did this concept of a new and living way? Now, do you understand? The new way and the living way? We're talking about eternal way. All right. See, it's important to have background to some of that. that. That's a piece of information that's highly important. Here's point number two. The writer of Hebrews introduced, introduced us to the new living way doctrine, the doctrine of the new living way, to enter the holy place by the blood and flesh of the flesh or body of Jesus. When you take part in the Eucharist, two parts to it. What, what are they? The, the bread, which is the body of Christ, and the blood, right, is, is, the, is the cup, the blood of Christ. The cup is the blood of Christ. It's what the writer is saying. What, what does that make up? It don't make up gobbledygook. I'll tell you what it makes up. It makes up Christ died on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead. He has to qualify. He has to be the perfect, perfect lamb of God that came into the world to take away the sin of the world. John 129. Listen, you're a sinner because of Adam. It's your behavior doesn't make you a sinner. Nor does it make you righteous. People got this idea that they can just live a good life and be okay. Listen, living a good life is okay but you're not okay in the eyes of God. No man. Who do you think you are? No man comes to the Father except through Christ. And how does he come through Christ? Just thinking about it? No, he's got to believe that he died on the cross for his sins, not, not for his own sins, but for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. If you're going to preach the gospel, preach that. If you're not going to preach that, don't preach the gospel. Go, go, go get a job. Therefore, here's what he says. Therefore, un, which goes back to verse 17 and 18. Back to 17. The word therefore is why for, right? So go back 17 and 18. And their sins and their lawless deeds I remember no more. For where there is forgiveness of the, these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. See, it's a, it, the door has been shut on it. The work has been completed. Christ has done all the work that's necessary for us to enter into an eternal redemption as well as an, have an eternal, eternal inheritance. And so the writer, that's the word therefore. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter, the holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through his veil, that is his flesh. You know what he's talking about, the veil there? He's talking about entrance into the holies of holies. That's what he's talking about up there. Now listen to, listen to Hebrews 9.24 and get this in your, understand what the writer's saying, because in chapter 9.24, he told you what the holy place was. He told you what he's talking about. Here it is. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. In other words, the temple. Never did that. Now, he entered the temple, but not the holies of holies. Because only the high priest could do it. And he wasn't from the tribe that qualified him. You understand it? And a writer goes into great lengths in chapter 9 to explain that. He did it chapters 5, 6, and 7. When he talked about the priesthood of Jesus Christ is not after Levi, it's after Melchizedek. Christ did not enter a holy place. He's talking about heaven made with hands, a mere copy of the true one. Where's the true one? Where, listen, what was the original master copy for the temple? It was in heaven. 
the master copy was held in heaven. The earthly one was done according to the one that was designed in heaven. You understand? The blueprint, uh, the architect, and the blueprints was from God and was kept in heaven. We bu they built it on earth according to the master plan. And what is the temple? Shadow Christology. Everything about it was shadow Christology. It was there until Christ would come and Christ would fulfill it. Right? He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. Well, Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, an earthly temple, a mere copy of the true one, the one in heaven, but into heaven itself. I didn't want you to miss it, so I put it in bold print. What are we talking about, the holy place, the new and living? Right, Johnny? What is it? Heaven itself. Can't miss that one, right? Left, we ain't guessing about that one, Shirley. We got that one clear. We're not guessing. Well, I'm not, then leave it up to you. This is an open book test. You should get 100. Agreed? Yeah. We know what the holy place is. The new and living, right? We know what the holy place is. So when we read, when we read this thing, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Christ, uh, by a new and living way which he inaugurated through the veil that is his flesh, now we know what he's talking about. He's talking about heaven itself. And you know what we talk about when we die? We talk about what absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. When he, before he was raised from the dead, it was be present with God through me. Now it's to be present with me through the gospel. Can't make this stuff up more. This is good. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one in heaven, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 1 John 2, 1, you know what he is there for us? An advocate, right? Our advocate. Let the devil come and blast all he wants, covered by the blood of the Lamb. In the Lamb's book of life, sealed forever. Hoo-ah. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12. Not through the blood of goats and calves, old covenant, but through his own blood, new covenant. He entered the holy place. What do you think that is? The only one he qualified to enter. Then he never qualified to enter the other one. You understand? He couldn't go to the holies of holies. What's he talking about? Heaven itself. What's that? It's where the real deal started. He didn't have a rope tied to his leg either. Well, there you go. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, so. Oh. There you go. Pull, pull him. Yeah, right. Yeah. Bring that toast, that burnt toast out, right? Yeah, very good, Horton. Uh, you, you uh, My mind wasn't even there. Uh, through the blood of goats, through his own blood, he entered the holy place, heaven once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Then this leads us to another question, or at least it does a guy like me. It leads to another question. What is the difference? Watch this now. What is the difference between an old covenant believer die death and going to heaven than a new Testament believer. See, that's a big deal. That was a big deal. And Jesus Christ settled that. He, his historical advent, death on the cross, burial, raised, ascended back to the Father. See the right hand of God changed all of that. Changed the whole kit and caboodle. Still don't know what a kit and caboodle is, do you? <laughs> No, they both led you to Christ. But I'm going to give you the answer to probably, maybe, maybe point three. When an old covenant believer died, he went to Hades or Sheol. 
to await the order of the resurrection of the second coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23 for your future study. I got it on your paper. Now, listen. Here's how it worked under the Old Covenant. Luke 16, 22, 23. Now, the poor man died. Jesus talking about a, a, a situation. Now, a poor man died, and we know his name. He's, he's called Lazarus. Now, a poor man died. Now, this is not the Lazarus he raised now. This is a different one. Apparently, a fa famous name like Bob. I don't know. Now, now, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Old Testament concept. And a rich man also died and was buried in Hades. He lifted up his eyes because he was in torment. You see, Hades was a place that had three parts to it. It had, it had Abraham's bosom or paradise. It had a place called torment. And it had a place for fallen angels, a Tartarus. Okay. Where is he? Where is he? No, the, the rich man who died, where is he? He's in torment. The rich man died in Haiti. The rich man died in Hades. He lift up his, his eyes because he was in what? Torment. And saw Abraham a far way off and Lazarus in his bosom. Just to give you an inside look at where unbelievers go. Now, What's interesting in this story to me is verses 28 through 31. Because the rich man has a conversation with Abraham over there, with Lazarus. They have a conversation going on. Now, where, where, where is Hades located, do you know? In the middle of the earth. In the middle of planet earth. All right. Now, we've, we've done all these studies. Okay. I'm just telling you. Now, in verses 28 through uh, 31, he has a conversation with him. A conversation goes on. He has five brothers at home. Remember that story? And he wants somebody to be raised from the dead to go back and knock on the door and tell them that there is a real place called hell and if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to come here. And I think if somebody went back, maybe a little, little but leave a, I don't, go back and tell them. <laughs> Thought maybe we'd leave a couple dead worms on them or something. Well, go back and talk to them. They, they would certainly believe. Well, look, for some people, they might. But here's what he told him. Nah. Because you still have to use the same word of God. It don't matter who carries it. It's still about the word of God. It's still the gospel. It's still Jesus Christ dies for his sin and is buried, raised from the dead. If they don't believe it, they don't get saved. It don't matter who tells them. It don't matter if it's somebody who's been dead in 100 years and comes back, or a person that's a teenager and he walks up to you and says, boom. I find that to be kind of interesting to me. Five brothers. And you know what he, what he wanted to do? Do, listen, plead with them not to come to this place of torment. I find it interesting that people in hell, hell have more compassion than people on earth about people not being saved. Huh? Yeah. I mean, something's wrong with that picture, isn't it? Something wrong with that picture. Well, it's, no, it's, it's all about Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who Amen. believes. See, the gospel is the power. <laughs> The gospel is the power of God. All God looks for is anybody who can carry the message. Anybody can carry the bucket of water. But you got to be able to tell them it's a bucket of water that has eternal life in it. But anybody can carry the bucket of water. 
because it's, it's not about the person. It's about the bucket of water. It's not about the person. It's about the gospel they carry. It's never about you or me. It's the, it's the message we carry. We are ambassadors for Christ with the message of the gospel. And listen, when people, when people reject it, they're not rejecting you. Right? They're not rejecting you. Don't get all squirrely. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the gospel in you. If you'd have brought them something about Alabama or Auburn football, they'd have probably, you know, invited you to dinner. It's a, it's a message. It's a message. Well, and, and what was my point? The point that Jesus was making, he was telling you about what happens to believers under the old covenant and unbelievers. Now, here's what he says about believers. What he told you a moment ago, where was the poor man, Abraham's bosom? Where was the rich man? The rich man wasn't, didn't go to torment because he was rich. He tells you why he went there. He didn't believe the gospel that he wanted somebody to go tell his brother, right? He tells you. I mean, he understands why Lazarus is over there and he's over here. He understands why he's, he's, he, he's in a good place and I'm in a bad place. And he understands what it is because I want, I want somebody to go carry the message to my brothers that they don't come here. Okay. To the thief on the cross in Luke 24, 31, Jesus tells him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me where? Who, and who is the thief going to be with in paradise? Jesus. That day. That day. That day. <laughs> when Jesus died, where do you think he had to go? <laughs> Did I? He had to go to, he had to, go to Hades. Yeah. When the thief on the cross died, he had to go to Hades. What about the other thief? When he died, he had to go to Hades. It depends on where you go when you go to Haiti, because everybody went to Haiti. That wasn't an island. Uh, uh. <laughs> oh, as pronounced differently, I see. All right, so, look. You know what's interesting is how these two other guys are described in the scriptures. You know how they're described? You ought to go back and read Luke on this thing. Not now, later. You ought to go back and read it. Because they're, they're listed as three criminals dying on the hill of Golgotha. Three charged with the same crime against the state. And they have a conversation from the cross not about God, but about the crime they are and the guy in the middle. And they say, we're guilty of ours. This guy's not. They were aware that Christ did only good things and the farthest thing he could be is a criminal, but they deserve to be where they are because they were legit criminals and he wasn't. Yet he was charged with a, stat with a capital crime deserving the capital punishment. How about that? Uh, you ought to read that stuff. You ought to read this. So you ought to read all the verses around Luke 23. It, there's a, I mean, when you go from like 32 to 42 uh, or to 43, it's dynamite. Well, anyhow, only one, only one chose to believe, and he got to go to paradise. So there, no work involved in it, is there? Huh? I mean, if there's work, then everybody's got to go to the cross and die, right? So I take the easy road. I'm going to go like the other one, huh? In Acts 2.23, in Acts 2.31, I'm sorry. In Acts 2.31, it says, He, King David, he looked ahead in prophecy, David speaking prophetically, it says, he, David, speaking prophetically, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades 
nor did his flesh suffer decay. Which means that he's on a three-day program. Four days you stink. And what put him on a three-day program? Matthew 12, 40. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and he'll be, he'll be back. I wrote all that on your paper. And where did Jesus go when he died? He went to Hades and he was all over the place. First Peter, the third chapter, 18 through 20, says he even spoke to the fallen angels that was involved in Genesis 6. He was all over the place. I, I guess he jumped over. Uh, we don't know that he visited a torment place, right? Except on the cross. He visited that. Listen, he, he went through torment on the cross. He didn't need to go through it down there. But he visited a paradise and uh, Tyrus. We know that. I put it on you. Listen, I, I didn't. I just. I told you where I found it. And I put it on the scripture for you. I put it on your paper. You. It's up to you to read it. Okay. Now here's the fourth point. New covenant death. Our death, the new covenant believer's death, is connected to Jesus Christ, death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and being seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Every bit of that is important to you and I. You don't get to heaven except going through the cross burial and resurrection of Christ. You don't get there. And if you go that way, then you got that. It's not based on behavior. It's based on belief. In Acts 2.33, you know, this is all about Pentecost sermon. Therefore, having been exalted, this is, listen, now everybody's on the same page. In, in Christianity, we start on the same page. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. He's talking about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I've got to leave and he's got to come. And when he comes, he's the guy. Spirituality. This is why spirituality is the key to the Christian life. We're under new covenant. We're not under works of the law. We're, we're under grace and faith. Spirituality is the name of the game. If I could get you to really believe that, we would be dynamite. The weak link in having a just a phenomenal ministry is not buying in 100% to spirituality on a day-to-day, moment-moment basis we surrender so many times to the flesh we can get a phone call being a flesh in a heartbeat I mean, people can just look at us the wrong way and we're in the flesh just look at us the wrong way you know, we got, got listen we have way too many elevators too many keys to the elevator too many buttons you got to eliminate those buttons. Nobody can take those buttons off your elevator. People push too many buttons in your life to push you into flesh. You've got to learn to conquer that thing. And when you do, you're going to see the dynamics of the Holy Spirit. See, I tell you what bothers me. When I talk to people in counseling, I find out they know more about their flesh than they do about the Holy Spirit. Someplace... In spiritual maturity, you ought to be knowing a whole lot more about the Holy Spirit than you do your flesh. Your flesh has been the worst enemy you've ever lived with in your life. And you should have every desire in your life to put him at rest. Get rid of that thing. And if you walk in the power of the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of flesh. Is that not simple? But you got to walk in the Spirit. That's a present tense command. 
you've got to, listen, you've got to quit losing your battles. You know, we seem to do all right with long swords and we don't do good in close battle. Those people that really know our buttons. Listen, you take those buttons off and they can't have to push, right? You are, listen, I'm telling you. If you'll buy into this concept, you will see God do unbelievable things on a daily basis. He will take the smallest things in your life and magnify them to such mighty places because his spirit is supernatural. I mean, something that would just be a simple conversation, a simple deed, just a simple something to help somebody. Like the other day, a simple thing. I, I, I had my cup of coffee and I had my briefcase. I was pushing the door. And I saw this lady coming with a baby and a couple down here. And, you know, and I went. So I pushed this thing way back like that. I didn't think about anything about it. I went, look, she's in worse shape than I am right here. So I pushed that door back. And she's overwhelmed by it. She's just overwhelmed by it. And so, you know, I was able to, to talk to her about it. I said, it looks like you're having a pretty, a pretty hefty day right here, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning with a house full of kids and, and uh, her headed to work, it looked like. And so I said, look, I know you're really busy and everything, but I need to have a word of prayer with you. Can I, I it'd be quick, but listen, I think you need, I think you need a prayer. I said, I've been where you are. My wife has been where you are. And boy, I know it. And she said, oh, oh would you ever? I know you have those, but look, it's, it's, not, it's not always the big things. Walking in the spirit is a dynamic in your life. And he will use the most unusual things, just a sense of courtesy. And you go like, well, and I was about to leave. And the spirit goes like, mm-mm. Let's have word prayer. Is that mama? That mama is on a dead run right now. Yeah. Give her just a quick prayer. Give her a prayer. And she could thank me enough. You know how I need it. I went like, yeah. Yeah. And I almost shut the door on her. And, and listen, and that's, listen, the Holy Spirit won't let you do it. Now, when he, when he tugs at you like that, you got to do it, don't you? You got to do it. You just got to do it. I go like, hmm. I don't know. She's busy. They're in a rush. I, I, I get, uh-uh. You do this. She needs that. She needs it today. So I, I, I can't talk about your life. I can only talk about mine. Okay? So I know you have your stories. And if you don't, you should. I don't tell you my stories because I think I'm some kind of big guy because I have a flesh and all that stuff. I'm just saying I'm trying to remove my buttons Trying to remove them on my buttons. Nobody, I put them on my, I put the buttons on my elevator. Nobody put them on me. I put them on myself. Created them all by my little lonesome. And I'm the guy that takes them off. But the quicker you do it, the better off you're going to be because walking in the spirit is the name of the game. In Colossians 1.13, or 118, in Colossians 1.18, Listen to what he says about Jesus Christ. Seated at the right hand of God the Father because he's done his work on earth, right? Now, he, he's, now he's, he's fulfilling his, he finished his work on earth and he's fulfilling his work in heaven. He finished his work, did you get that? And he's fulfilling his work in heaven. Listen to what some of his work in heaven is. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the church. Say, I'm not. That's a title you should never give me. It's a title I will never accept. I am not the head of the church. I wouldn't take that responsibility. Listen, you got to go to the cross, die, be buried, raised from the dead in order to qualify for it. I don't want that. That's a job I don't want, Frank. Nah, I, I don't want that one. He's the head of the church. He is the beginning. You know what I love about that, Frank? Every day is a new beginning. Every day is a new beginning. But it's got to begin with Christ. Christ is the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega. Listen, don't worry about the omega part. Just worry about the alpha part. 
Stay in the beginning because your life every day is a beginning until the end. Every people go like, well, what are you gonna do when you yeah, yeah, yeah? And I go like what what I'm doing, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, what? I live in the beginning, not the end. I don't even think about end. I don't think about end. When I go to bed at night, I don't think that's the end of the day. I think about the next day coming. I don't look at a half a glass of water that, you know, it's, it's, it's half full. It's not half empty. I just don't look at that way. I don't look that way. I have no reason to look that way. I'm just telling you. He's the head of the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. How about that? Firstborn from the dead. To the church, he's the firstborn. You know how I, why I know I'm going? Because he went. He, he created the new living highway to heaven. You remember the program Highway to Heaven? Many years ago, Highway to Heaven. Highway to Heaven. Highway to Heaven. We all got the highway to heaven. Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. That's this new living way. That word hodas means a road or highway. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Give it to him. I mean, he's already the first place. Make it, bring it into the reality of your life. First place in everything. First place in everything. That'll change your life. First place in everything. <laughs> I use that all the time with my kids when they play sports. Always remember you're in first place in everything. Go out there and honor Christ. Because you're first place in everything. There are no losers in Christ. There are none. Only the people who surrender their sword. First place in everything. <laughs> I love that. I use that. I still I use it now with my grandkids. Ty's, Ty is 0-3 right now. And he's he's about to have a fit. 0-3. I said, well, it sounds to me like you think your season's over. Yeah. You're first place in everything. Well, we'll see where you get that. I don't know. Get your Bible, son. Get your Bible. First place in everything. Don't you like that? First place in everything. Whenever you think you're in the last place, that ain't true. Why? Because the Christ has got you first place. First place in everything. I love that. Therefore, Colossians 3, 1, therefore, if first class condition true if you have been raised up in christ and you have that's positional sanctification if you have been raised up with christ keep seeking the things above where christ is seated at the right hand of god the father what he tells you to do keep seeking the things above where christ is you know what he tells you he says you're first place in everything why would you not i give you I crown you first place in everything. Now live it out. How do I live it out? Keep, keep seeking what Christ has taught you in your daily living. You're first place in everything. Why would you sit in the back row? <laughs> I love that. Hey, you know what Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 says? Oh, listen to me. It says that, Frank, you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. How did you get there, Frank? Jesus Christ, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, because you live in the new culture, the Holy Spirit baptized you into union with Christ and put you in a seat next to Jesus Christ in heaven, Frank, and your feet are still on earth. Ooh, ah, let me tell you, you're seated, seated with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ. Seated, oh, you missed it. Because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. You are seated there positionally. You are seated with him because you're in him. That's what Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 says. Oh, that is so good. You're already seated with him. Of course, what's going to happen when you die? 
You, your position's already there. It's already there. It's already there. <laughs> Seated with Christ because you're in Christ. <laughs> Ooh, uh, I get so upset when Christians consider themselves to be second in anything when you're first place in everything. By grace, not by works, not because you deserve it, not because of anything, because of his grace. <laughs> Jeez. Here's my, do it again, Horton. Keep looking down. I know, I know. Hoping we'll find a penny. That's where we are. Yeah, we got a gold mine up there. That's what he tells you. He tells you in Colossians 3, 1, he tells you, look up, look up. Here's point five, closing. When a new covenant believer dies, he goes immediately to the third heaven into the presence of Christ. Immediately. How about that? Got nothing to do with what, how you behave. It's got to do with what you believe. Now, if you're smart, you'll live for Christ. For me to live is Christ and die is gain. That's at Philippians 121. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 4, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, but God knows. But here's what I do know. Such a man was caught up into the third heaven. In verse 4, he says, caught up to paradise. Oh, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Paradise has been moved. The church age believer goes to paradise in heaven. What heaven? Third heaven it's identified as. We haven't been there yet except those who believe in Christ. Listen here. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, talk about the rapture. Listen to this. Then we who are alive and remain, feet on earth, will be caught up. There's the same word, caught up. Same word. Shall be caught up together with them. Those are the church age believers who have died and are present with the Lord. We'll be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet whom? The Lord in the air. You see, you're either going to meet him in the air or on the chair. <laughs> right? <laughs> but you're definitely going to meet him. I love that. So we shall always be with the Lord. See, we're, we know we'll always be with the Lord. Even when our feet's on earth, we'll always be with the Lord because we're positionally in him now. We are seated with him in Christ in the heavenly place. And you will meet him either in the air or on the chair. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, be of good courage, I say. I don't know how many funerals I preach this at. Be of good courage, I say. And who is a good courage to? Those who are left behind. And be of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. In Philippians 1.23, Paul says, you know, I have a desire to depart and be with, be with Christ. My greatest desire in life is to leave this world because I'm going, I'm going to a better place, right? But if I stay behind, then I stay behind and do the work of the Lord. I don't stay behind for me. I stay behind and do the work of the Lord. I love that. Well, tomorrow night, because I've finished up with the angelic conflict, I'm going to carry over the doctrines that we run into out of Hebrews 10. So I'm going to carry on. Uh, do you understand the new doctrine we have tonight? How it, was, how it was revved up and supercharged, uh, new and living way, highway to heaven. I wanted to title it, but it would, be, it would, it would have been given away. You would have got it right away. Uh, 
That's not fair. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come to Bible study both by automobile and by internet. We pray that everybody would take all this serious. And those who are within driving range to us, especially on Tuesday night, we always have something to eat here for those who are getting off work late and come on here at 6 and have dinner with us and 6.30 to 7.30, we'll feed you again. We'll feed you the word of God. Because the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We think it's important to assemble and meet other people of like minds and be part of a unit of great ministry. And so we, we pray. But we know there are a lot of people that can't, disabled and all of that. We know that, Father. And we're thankful that, for, that we have this internet ministry. But for those who are able, not, not those who are just whinies, and they've got a thousand reasons why they shouldn't come to Bible study. It takes effort. But we thank you, Father. We thank you for great ministry. Encourage our hearts with the word of God tonight, the new and living way that brought, was brought to us by Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for it, Father. We're so thankful to be living in the new covenant age of the new and living way to heaven. Oh, Father, thank you for it. I pray there would be none out there. We encourage those who have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to do it tonight. Do it now. Today. Today. This moment is your opportunity to believe. And state your belief to the Father. You believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. Close the deal. Close the deal. It is forever. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.